Master Tavern Keeper's History of the Old World. Oh, well, it seems that your harfling friend there, Ludwig Brambledown, was a lot more savvy, resourceful and lucky than any of us thought. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, after getting himself an ogre bodyguard and a blind sorceress as a guide, what did he do next? Ah, yes, a fine question, and one that Ludwig himself answered in great detail as we drank together in the tavern in Martek. Well, Septimus, what happened next was this. We ate and drank into the late hours with the sorceress, Zaka al Yamama, and her grandson, Fadi, until our bellies were full and our eyelids droopy. But by the end of the night, an agreement had been reached, and she swore an oath on her forefathers that she would get us both to Martek and then back again to al Haik. In return, I promised her two more jewels from the small treasure chest I had uh, acquired, in addition to the emerald that I had already given her. Thus, with her oath given, I allowed myself and Hassan the privilege of sleep. The next day, Hassan and I awoke to the sound of bones clacking against each other. I raced out of the tent and could not believe my eyes. The blind, Zaka al Yamama, stood in the centre of the camp, chanting. The two, what I thought were large but innocuous piles of bones at the camp's entrance were no longer innocuous. They danced as if attached to invisible strings, those of some great puppeteer upon high, raising them up and then stitching them together. Leg bones became sewn to horns, tusks, tails and toes becoming what looked like a broad open ribcage facing the morning sky and spinal columns weaving and interlocking with each other to create four large wheels. As I stood, transfixed by the process, Zarka's grandson, Fadi, approached me. It is amazing, is it not, Master Kazamun? I have seen my grandmother do this many times, but it never ceases to impress me. It is no wonder her rivals wished to see her dead. But, 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 but what is she making, Fadi? Why, it is how you will cross the desert. It is a caravan. A caravan of bone. And so it was, my dear Septimus. With the skeleton complete, she dressed it in the fabrics and coverings of her tents. And, by the end of the process, it did not look so different than the caravans of many travellers of the desert, if a little larger and bulkier. As I waited, I went to look at the four skinny camels that would no doubt be pulling our conveyance. How could four such wretches pull such a caravan, such a large caravan, I thought to myself. But as I approached them, the answer presented itself. They were dead. What? The camels were so gaunt looking because they were dead. Or more precisely, they were undead. They possessed not a shred of flesh, 
Instead, they too were skeletons, over which padded camel skins had been thrown and sewn. At a distance, they were not too dissimilar to the real thing, but as you got close, the smell was clearly not the same. Oh, were they particularly rank with the stink of the dead then? Oh no, quite the opposite. Unlike the awful reek of real camels, the bleached clean bones and sun-dried camel skin were not pungent at all. And so, with the preparations made, Ludwig et al., as they say in ancient Tylian, set off for the city of Martek. And so, I am supposing that uh, was simply a trek across endless dunes and uh, banks of sand. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. Araby is no homogeneous desert. The lay of the land is far more varied than that. Here, this is a good opportunity, I think. Let me give you a uh, brief overview of the topography of Araby. That will give you a better idea of what we're dealing with. As we all know, Araby occupies the northwest coast of the Southlands and stretches from this coastline over the Atalam Mountains into the Great Desert. And it is this that separates a majority of the country from the lands of the dead. That said, the eastern city of Kar still sits very much under the shadow of Kemri and Qatar, but yet still persists, nay, thrives, in spite of both death and undeath, lurking out its doorway. Anyway, the Atalam Mountains themselves are very much the backbone of the country, but at the same time a serious hindrance to both trade and travel, for they are also all but impassable. Well, apart from the uh, Cobra Pass, that is. Now, this lies in the southern half of the range between the lands of the Dihib in the west and Vulture Mountain in the east. Oh, and before you ask, Heinrich, I can almost see the question forming on your lips. Vulture Mountain is one of a number of standalone mountains. Other famous solitary peaks include both Eunuch Mountain, famed for the warriors that train upon it and are employed as bodyguards across the country, and the mysterious Mountain of the Spectres. Of this, though, uh, I know no more than its name. I could not even tell you where it lies. But back to Araby as a whole. Heinrich, you are not wrong in your uh, implied assumption that Araby is a hot, arid land. Open fresh water is scarce and precious, and very few areas are naturally fertile. The people get much of their water from deep wells, and the shrubland that exists requires painstaking irrigation to work and produce crops. Beyond these areas, you are right, though. There is sand, hectares upon hectares upon hectares of sand. Besides the heat and the sun, the other primary danger, one I experienced myself in the aftermath of the slaughter in the Swamp of Terror, is called the Harmatan. This is the name they give to the dangerous wind that blows across the country, a wind so powerful that attracts such massive sandstorms that they've been known to block out the sun for days, as well as bury whole caravans and small settlements under the dunes. But neither is it hot, dry and windy everywhere, nor all of the time. The peaks of the tall Atalam mountains that loom over the city of Martek, for example, are oft visited by pregnant clouds from the west and squeezed of their waters by the mountains themselves. And when this happens, it rains, it pours, washing over rock and stone to create seasonal streams that flow and then mingle with each other 
to create the great western rivers of Araby, the most famous of which is the River of the Serpent that feeds the city of Lashik as it flows into the Bay of Corsairs. Smaller rivers, likewise, bring water to other cities, towns and villages, as well as feeding the numerous oases that you can find across the country, from north to south and east to west. Oh, yeah, I see. Fascinating. Ah, well, I think so. Anyway, as I brought you this far, let me just uh, finish you off by painting you a picture of Araby as a whole with a few broad last strokes to try and uh, bring together all the dribs and drabs of information I've thus far mentioned before we return to the journey of our lovable halfling, Ludwig Brambledown. Essentially, Araby can be divided between the territories of the coast of Araby and to the north, and the northwest of the Atalan Mountains, and the area known as the Great Desert of Araby, called the Sahra, by the Arabians themselves. Although it is not a completely deserted area, as living within it are the nomadic tribes. And you also have such cities as El Calabad and Kasabar, which we've already talked about. Oh, and uh, as well as the uh, two crusader cities on the Gulf of Medes, amongst others. As we've discussed, its nominal head of state is the great Sultan of Al Haik, and his power extends over all of this. But, much as the ancient Nehekaran city states did, the other cities are fully autonomous and left to their own devices, so long as fealty is given to the centre, to Al Haik. Anyway, I think that puts everything in its right place. Next, let us return to the journey that Ludwig undertook as he went to Martek. <laughs> 